Hello, everyone. <laughs> and hi, John. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Now, I'm kind of from an age when we all just used to eat food at home. Our mothers cooked them and so on. Fast food is something that's coming in my lifetime. And I guess before we even start talking, I'd like to throw open the question to everyone, is fast food sustainable? And you're going to have three options, I believe, which are uh, yes, always, no, it doesn't affect sustainability, and consumers need to change their behavior first. If you could put your answers in. What do you think? Do I get to find their answer now? <laughs> yeah, we get to see. So yes, always. No, it doesn't affect sustainability, and consumers need to change their behaviour first. Well, that's very easy. Everyone thinks consumers need to change. Oh, no, no, it hasn't changed yet. No, it's, it's moving, it's moving. Mostly. Final answer? Yeah, 89% for 83%. Oh, it's still going. Oh, it's still going. The election should be like this. It's much more <laughs> So 77% for the consumers need to change their behaviour. 13% uh, for enemy of, enemy of sustainability and 10% for it doesn't affect sustainability. What's your answer to that? Because Leon is a company which, at its very heart, has sustainability, mm -hmm. which at the time you found it was quite unusual. But is there an incompatibility between fast food and sustainability? I, th I think that there is fundamental, uh, the way we've constructed everything, there's a fundamental conflict with uh, human character. Uh, and sustainability. And Leon is part of the problem, as is other parts of the fast food chain. What I would say is that um, good fast food, let's just try this out for size, good fast food, I think, has a potential to be part of uh, moving towards a solution. So let me try this on for size, which is that I think the problem is bad food, whether it's uh, you know sustainably uh, harmful food, whether it's through a fast food supply chain or whether it's through supermarkets, I think uh, you will get um, food that has destructive uh, palm oil-esque, avocado-esque, uh, beef-esque um, negative impacts, whether it's consumed through a supermarket supply chain or whether it's through a fast food chain. I would also argue that given the fact that the single biggest contributor to carbon emissions is uh, agriculture, um, that in fact uh, food waste is critical, uh, the way we farm is critical, the way we try and move away from monoculture is critical, um, and the waste that takes place in a domestic supply chain is four to six times higher than the waste that takes place through uh, an optimised fast food chain. Because we all think, oh, there's no waste at home, but in fact there is. You know, we throw away a huge amount of food that uh, is left in our fridge. Uh, when we make a dish, it's very unlikely that the produce that we get from the supermarket for that meal will exactly match in proportions the actual food that each of those people need. So the food waste is actually in a domestic uh, supply chain is huge. And I guess we have a, a commercial... Um, uh, bias to try and optimise the waste. I would also say that in fast food uh, we have an opportunity, this is fast food generally before I get to Leon, we have an opportunity to get the food through a very optimised supply chain without all of these cars, uh, these shopping trips. So, you know, if I think about if you wanted to optimise the supply chain, you might invent good fast food. You might say, you know what, let's make sure that we get it right to where people are underneath their offices without necessarily them having to do all of these shopping trips. So I would suggest that if it's done well, it has an opportunity to optimise. Now, we, we've said, oh, how can we be at the forefront of that? And when we started Leon in 2004, we were called the Guardian Reading Lesbian Brand. Um, and um, uh, because, you know, we, 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 we believed in some really weird stuff, like, uh, like the preserving the planet. <laughs> and that was, like, really really weird, right? Um, and so I think that you know, we can hopefully be part of the solution, but also f in terms of the supply chain, uh, this, give me 10 more seconds on this. I think exactly. the fact that we're in fast food means that we can dramatically impact everything that happens in that supply chain. And, and our focus from now on and it, is really understanding how we can rewild everything in that supply chain. Because I think the carbon issue and the uh, 
biodiversity loss issue are kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, and we think we've got a responsibility to work with our farmers, uh, with the way we transport, with the way we build our restaurants, the impact we have on public opinion, and the policies we have around um, you know, uh, the, our coffee, um, the way we contribute internationally. I chair something called the Council for Sustainable Business for the UK government, which you're very welcome to contribute to. Um, and we have a responsibility being in that game, not only to impact the supply chain, but to be a media outlet. So we are here at Bloomberg, you knew that, right? Um, as, which is a hugely influential media outlet. You know, but we, we serve something like 50 million people uh, a year, and we have a, probably an impact on about three or 400 million as a result of people that they know immediately. So we kind of see ourselves increasingly as a media outlet. And when I do work for the Council for Sustainable Business, the government's actions are often impeded by the public opinion. So the government often would like to go further with some of the things, but we kind of get the leaders we deserve because the public often isn't ready for some of the action that's required. I know. I mean, people, everyone says they support sustainability nowadays, but people don't really want to pay much for their food. How much of a problem is that for you? Because you need to make a profit at the end. Well, I think there's that stat, isn't there, that in the US, something like 25 years ago, 6% was on healthcare and 16% of spend was on food. And now it's reversed. Because I think that what we're very good at is creating a, a demand for funeral services. So, you know, I think that there's a sort of, there was a mall in America that had a, cre it had a, a childbirth centre, a creche, a toy shop, uh, a marriage shop, a uh, fast food shop, and then a f funeral service. And I thought, well, there it all is, all in a line. Um, and um, so I think we're very good at producing crap food that we don't want to pay for. And then we're very good at, you know, getting diseases which that bad food creates and then elastoplasting it with drugs. And I think that you know, a friend of mine has, does anyone know Juno Therapeutics? It's, a, it's, a, it's the biggest biotech listing in America. And my friend Hans, it was the most successful anti-cancer treatment for a long time. And it's one of those things that trains your white blood cells to kill the T cells, so immunotherapy. And so bear in mind, this is one of the biggest ever listings and one of the biggest ever then exits uh, $6 billion for a cure, which then cured a very, very, very narrow form of leukemia, which is brilliant. But I sat down with Hans, who's made a ton of money, right? And I was like, mate, you're my hero. Well done for what you've achieved. You know, who doesn't want to make $200 million for helping cure cancer? And he was like, actually, John, I've got to be honest with you. In encouraging people to eat more vegetables, <laughs> you're actually doing more than we achieved with our $6 billion exit. Because actually, as an expert in immunotherapy, as an expert in cancer, I would say that eating more vegetables will have a better impact than even all of this money that's poured into this immunotherapy. Can you talk a bit about some of the things you've done at Leon? Yeah. Um, I once had a, oh no, not those, sorry. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> not Kitchen Confidential. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so in the, about 2016, Kirsty, where's Kirsty? Kirsty's over there, who's a Leon Sustainability Director, and I sat down with John Sovan from Greenpeace. We had always been a little bit hippie from the start, and we'd focused on air miles, we'd focused on sustainable fish, we'd helped set up something called the Sustainable Restaurant Association. Uh, we had um, done something called the School Food Plan for the UK government, which was trying to revolutionise school food, following Jamie's alerting everyone to the challenge. We were then tasked with actually creating a plan to do something with that challenge. Um, and so we contribute there. But in 2016, we sat down with John Sovan and said, look, please help us. We, we think we've got some resource to try and understand the problem, but what should we be focusing on? And, and he gave us, along with other NGOs, three priorities for us. He said, number one, move from oil energy to green energy. So all of our energy, where we buy our energy, is, is now green, in inverted commas, non-oil based, so solar. Uh, so 100% of our energy where we buy it, we have no gas, it's all electricity, it's all renewable, in inverted commas. Secondly, he said, move from uh, beef to plants uh, as much as you can. And so we've had a dramatic shift on our menu to plant-based food, which isn't perfect in, you know, the palm oil's a plant, avocado's a plant, coffee's a plant, there are issues with that, it's not a panacea. Um, uh, but thirdly, he said, move dramatically away from plastics. Now, we weren't that bad on plastics. This was way before... Blue Planet and, you know, David Attenborough's uh, uh, cries, um, as in, you know, uh, uh, protestations. But we, 
we have we had in the last you know three years a dramatic shift away from plastic, but we weren't that bad on plastic. None of our pa all of our paper, all of our uh, packaging is card based. But you know we've in where we did have plastic through the supply chain, we've taken out eighty percent of it. I want to pick you up on the thing about yeah. plant versus meat. Yeah. We have another survey coming up, if you, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah uh, surveys. Is, the question is, is meat sustainable? And um, the o options you've got are yes, no, <clears throat> or avoiding meat won't save the planet. So if you wouldn't mind voting on that. And then I'm going to come back to on what meat. Leon is doing. Also, if anyone has any questions, feel free to do it via the app, or we can take them in a few minutes' time. A vegetarian? I am a rarely meat person. So I personally believe from a health perspective that um, you need a little bit of meat. Right, well this survey is quite um, a strong reaction, isn't it? Uh, if it's finished. So is meat sustainable? No, 60, well it's still moving 6-7%. Yes, 4%. Avoiding meat won't save the planet 30%. I mean, that's quite dramatic, isn't it? Well, I think the whole thing's quite dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> that, I mean, that's, that's, that's only one of a thousand dramatic things, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> As you say, there's less meat on your menu, but you've still yeah. got it. Would you consider yeah. making Leon completely vegetarian or even vegan? Um, I have, well, I have considered it. And as you can see, I've decided not to. <laughs> But um, not, not forever or no, not for I mean, now. I think that meat will. For me, um, we need to look at unintended consequences. Um, strawberries uh, eaten or certain tomatoes eaten in April have 100 times the carbon impact than the same tomatoes eaten in July. So I'd rather eat meat <laughs> in April than those tomatoes. So I've seen, you know, studied with, chairing this thing called the Council for Sustainable Business, I've looked at all sorts of unintended consequences that have happened when we've knee-jerked away, like sort of, like, you know, when you tap on fish on, a, on a, an aquarium, and they'll swim the other way. And I think that sometimes we're like that, we're just herd animals, that, that someone's tapping on our fish tank and we're going the other way. So I think we have to look at it properly and in the round. And I personally think that if you look at all meat, there's a hierarchy of um, gra uh, grams of feed per kilogram of output. And beef is at the top of that. Beef is also at the top of the carbon dioxide impact. So I would say if, if I'm going to do chicken, I sell a lot of chicken, perhaps by selling chicken, I'm bringing people down that ladder. And also, we need to understand when we are selling vegetables, we can't think that all vegetables are necessarily or all arable farming is necessarily good because, because I, want to think, I could give you a beef farm that is sustaining wildlife. You might not want to turn that into a monoculture, pesticide heavy uh, wheat, um, wheat field because actually it might kill the, the butterflies, the bees, and all the surrounding wildlife. So yeah. we have to, we, we, I don't think it's that black and white. I mean, even one of your arrivals, like yeah. pret manger now has all vegetarian things. I mean, that may be partly commercially driven. I'm assuming there's a big change in taste now. Definitely. Would you consider having some all vegetarian stores or are you ruling it out? For the no, I'm no, we absolutely probably will. Yeah. So <laughs> no, as in almost, almost certainly we will have a vegan fast food restaurant within the next 18 months. Really? So you must be working on it now. I'm a little bit last minute, but yeah, we are working. We've ha we have an entire concept of an entirely vegan menu, but I'm trying to answer the question from a systemic perspective and make the point that we need to look under the bonnet of the reality before we go and make wholesale changes that may have unintended consequences. So I think that it's part of the solution. Now, you, a lot of your work isn't just within Leon, isn't it? It's yeah. in the, the broader, broader yeah. context with the government and the Sustainable Restaurant yeah. Association. How hard are you having to push now? Are the doors just opening that people are genuinely changing their attitudes? Whose people? Government? The government, which I assume reflects what, what the public wants, though I'm not sure in the election really whether it does. But. OK, so I, I, I'm, I have a few. Does anyone work with the government here? 
Does anyone work for the government, for start? Does anyone work with the government? What do you do with the government? Uh, in a corporate role. Okay. So I've done a lot of work with the government, um, and I have a high regard for it, but I think it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, uh, I, if you look at, look, let's look at the reality, right? Um, there are pockets of amazingness. And if you look at, does anyone like pantomime? Yeah, you like pantomime. So, so I'm going to say Michael Gove. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so Michael Gove, for example, who did the school food play, everyone hates him. It looks funny. Apparently that's a reason to hate someone these days. Um, he looks funny, sounds funny, sounds a bit posh, uh, apparently. Um, he has done some amazing stuff um, with us on the school food plan and at DEFRA. And there are pockets of amazingness. Um, he's not the most, you know, when, when he reads everything we write, he'll come through his plan, he'll say, this is, I agree with this, let's do it. I disagree with this for this reason. I disagree with this for this reason. We say, well, you're wrong. And he says, oh, God, yes, I'm wrong. He's amazing, right? He works across government to get a thumbs up. But it's a pocket of excellence within a whole part of shit, right, in the government. I think we, we cannot look to government for the solutions. So let's start now. So, so we can't do anything right now because it's purder, right? So you have an election, you can't do anything, it's purder. Then they'll come back and there'll be a reshuffle, right? Then it'll be the summer holidays, right? And then it'll be another reshuffle. When there's a reshuffle, can you imagine if in Bloomberg, is it Mike Bloomberg, the guy that owns it? Yeah. yeah? Can you imagine he, I knew that, right? I knew that, I knew that, I knew that. Imagine Mike Bloomberg stops being the CEO and he has no handover whatsoever with the new one. That's what happens in government. The new Secretary of State comes in, and it's literally you, sod off. You, sit there, right? There is no handover. I mean, it is unbelievable. So if we're looking to government for the solutions, we are 100% looking in the wrong place. You're also working with schools, though, aren't you? Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. No, I think, edu I think schools are going to have a much bigger impact than than the government. <laughs> right. Now, I've got, I've got a couple of questions here. I'm reading this for now, but it's not my question. So Can I say one more thing more on the government? Yeah, please. <laughs> right, OK. So basically, the, his, so, so Boris Johnson, when he introduced himself to Michael Gove 30 years ago at the Yes Oxford Union, he said, what sort of um, Tory are you? And he expected wet or pre Brexit kind of guy at the time. And Boris Johnson said, I'm a green conservative. And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, I believe in sustainability. I believe in the environment. I believe in wildlife one of the most active environmentalists in this country for decades is Boris Johnson's dad, right? And Boris is a, I don't know this from Zach Goldsmith, I know this directly from Boris, he is deeply pro the environment. He's, he's, he's offered to chair personally our council. But if you look at the Tory manifesto, there's no green in it whatsoever. Why? That is not because of the Tory or Boris Johnson's philosophy on nature. It's because he's second-guessing the voters. So we get the politicians we deserve. If we say to our politicians, we care about this, we will vote for you, if you, have a, if you link commerce and sustainability in a really sensible way and you give us a vision for how commerce and life can sustain without constraining freedoms, yeah, by, by bringing freedom and responsibility together, then the government will change its policies. The governments, unfortunately, governments follow the proper people rather than the people following the government. So we have, to, we have to give these people permission to recognise we're ready for this. Do you find that depressing? I look, I try, I've written a book. It's a fucking good book, but it's really not fighting. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah? There's a whole thing on positivity, right? So, 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 so I, I try and explain that I, I'm not optimistic and I'm not pessimistic because that's not helpful, right? It's like doing a, star, doing a race, a, a sailing race, getting the whole crew together and going, before we start, I just wondered whether we could just debate whether we're optimistic or pessimistic about winning this race, right? So what, am, I, am I, do I think it's, do I think that humans are deeply flawed and need a complete reset on values from a spiritual perspective? Yes. Your book's called Winning Not Fighting, but it seems to me like you are fighting. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought I was just winning. <laughs> um, no, um, so does anyone think I'm fighting? So I'm try what I'm trying to do it's not is... It's Oh, no, but 100% oh, yes. Um, so so my, um, my statement in trying to encourage people is not trying to encourage people to fight. I'm trying to explain the fact that we have in us a, uh, the, in a, the ability to be manipulated through fear, right? And what I see, all of the headlines, you can literally... I've got fire, you know, fire at home, log burn. I pick up the paper. 
And almost every headline has got fighting, fear. You know, David Cameron suffers, or it's an old paper, right? David Cameron suffers double hammer blow, right? What's happening is that we are, the, the more fearful we become about the environment or about the economy or about Brexit, the more easy we are uh, to be controlled. And my, what I would like to see is for people to have more introspection, to, to, to understand how politics, business, consumer products everywhere is accelerating with the resulting increase in mental health issues, is accelerating as we become more concerned about the environment, is allowing us to be more manipulated. And that actually has a vicious cycle, has a negative effect, a vicious cycle. So all I would like to say is we've all, we're all, we all have responsibility to, um, to role model what we want in our daily lives as leaders in organisations to help our organisations, uh, the teams in our organisations, to play a more active role in policing us. And all of us need to encourage the government to have a better, more constructive, less fear-based dialogue. And I think there needs to be some structural changes in the way that uh, politics occurs, because literally politics is about fighting and not winning. So when we wrote the school food plan, we managed to line up Ed Balls, um, the Lib Dems and the Tories, the unions, um, the providers of school food, and elevate it above party politics. And because we did that, because we said it's about little children, um, they, we managed to achieve something. But throughout the process, we had to re-educate everyone in the process to say, don't use this as an opportunity to beat, kill, fight the opposition. Use this as an opportunity to actually focus on the reality of the problem. And then it occurred to me, oh, because everyone agreed that school food should be above party politics, right? Uh, and I thought, oh, why isn't everything above party politics? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If I can, isn't anything important worth collaborating on? Isn't anything important worth actually trying to not just find every opportunity to kill, but have an opportunity to get to the substance? And so, am I depressed? Let's put it this way. Do I think that the process in which politics seeks conflict, fighting over any, and more heat over light, yes, that is not good. OK, now I've got a couple of questions. Oh, oh my question's good. I'll read this out. It's not mine. The odd fast food is probably the only food fast food that I eat. Uh, who said that? <laughs> As a non as a non lesbian, the Guardian reading oh. reading B. As a non lesbian. Um, salt content is massive. What's about the other health issues as well? Um, yeah, so salt content is massive in Leon, did you say? Sorry. It's, could you read the salt bit again? Um, salt is a massive issue or a massive or Leon's Salt content salt. is massive. What about addressing health aspects too? To okay, so who asked that question? Can I clarify it's the question? Is it saying that the salt, that there's a lot of salt in Leon, or? Oh, no, that's fair enough. Yes. 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 Yes, it's not, yes, it can have, it can be damaging. Chips are vegan, right? You can have chips with salt and vinegar and it's vegan, right? Of course, yeah. Yes. Thank you. OK, so first of all, I'm sorry, I didn't know the Love Burger had that much salt in it. We, we always sign it off at a, there's a whole team that signs off all the health aspects of every single dish, so I didn't know that, so thank you. Um, the, we've always said fast food must good fast food must taste good, do you good and be kind to the planet. And um, we have tried to navigate and decide what we think is healthy and then try and recognise that either from a perspective of their own knowledge or their own bodies, people have their own versions of what healthy is. So what we've tried to do is to say we try to match as closely as possible to the Mediterranean diet, which seems to be the one which is mostly where there's greatest consensus and greatest data about its efficacy. So we tend to say, right, what does that mean? It means um, we, we, we have almost no sugar. Everything has got as little sugar as possible. 
Um, we have a wide variety of plants, so not just plants as a percentage of the diet, but we know that all the colours have different phytonutrients. We know that each individual fruit encourages different gut bacteria. So different gut bacteria feed on tomatoes versus cucumber versus lettuce, for etc. So the diversity of the um, fruit that you, and veg that you get at Leon is deliberately diverse for those two reasons. We also then say that we encourage lots of active good fats. So if I look at the um, inflammatory impact of olive oil, um, that's why a lot, of our pro a lot of our products are deliberately high in omega-3. We have a lot of omega-6 in our diets, and it's the balance of 6, 3, and 9, which is important. And we tend, as mostly in the population, we tend to universally have low vitamin D, and we tend to have not enough omega-3 to balance the ratios. So we try and follow that. Um, and then we do try and have low salt. So I'm really sorry about the Love Burger. I'm going to look at it and uh, work out why it's got so much salt in it. Do you think menus should have mandatory sustainab sustainability classifications so that consumers can make an informed choice? I don't know, actually. <laughs> I have to have a think about that one. Um, I think that the trouble with any single me metrics is people then... It's a bit like the NHS. All of these measures that have come into the NHS haven't made the NHS any better. I mean, um, and we know, for example, with the measure of, um, with the measure of waiting times, get people in my local NHS trust, as soon as they go over a certain uh, number of weeks, they're not seen, because as soon as they're seen, they trigger as a metric. So there's a whole living dead category of people in my local NHS trust who are only put back into the system one by one when they go over a certain number of weeks. And so my concern is we, 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 we do need measures, but as long as they are as holistic as possible and people don't just focus on those at the expense of the reality. So, so my issue is that measures, sustainability measures, should only be health KPIs for, a more, for, for the reality, as opposed to... Does that make sense? So if there's a reality of how good you are, we need to get the best metrics on that. If we just focus on the metrics and we just try and deliver for those, we end up with the NHS situation, which is they don't actually fix the fundamental culture. They just cho chose those measures. So I'm just saying that's a danger of that. OK. Yeah. Uh, do people in the room have questions? I've got some coming in here, but if anyone's got any they'd like to ask from the room, I'm happy to take them. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I had a question about uh, the move towards plant-based foods, yeah. right? And I was thinking of soy and the procurement of soy. Yeah. Clearly quite a controversial issue as well. Um, how much clarity do you have in your supply chain in terms of where you're going to source soy from and yeah. meet this growing demand, if that is yeah. the intention that it will grow? Um, so we, we have full clarity. Um, we, I just as the tomatoes examples of the April versus July, the, where you get your soy from, um, how it's farmed, whether it's very GMO or a little bit GMO, because arguably it's all a little bit GMO to some degree. Um, we have a lot of clarity, but I do to... I think you've raised exactly the sort of point that I would like to make in response to the earlier question about meat versus soy, because a lot of the um, soy, soy isolate ingredients that are used for a lot of the meat replacement products um, are perhaps more net-net um, negative for the planet than a well-reared uh, piece of meat. Um, so I do think that this is exactly another argument for why we need to be careful. I'll give you an example outside food, which is um, batteries, as you know, um, for electric vehicles have um, a rare metal uh, requirement um, and now the Pacific the base of the Pacific Sea is being mined in order to find these uh, rare metals that are required for electric batteries and that's having a hugely destructive impact already on the Pacific seabed so I, I just think it's I, I get I chair the council for sustainable business I run a business where sustainability is one of the most important things and, and yet I'm also feeling quite ignorant. Do, do you see what I mean? So I, I, I don't know how voters are supposed to, you know, who, who, who spend all their time looking after 
nurses who look out, spend the whole time looking after patients all day. In their spare time, they're supposed to come up with this. So I think it's, it is a very um, difficult and complex uh, thing. Our soy, we are switching in June of next year, we're switching to entirely British soy um, because that is now becoming more available. Um, all of our quinoa, for example, which traditionally would have been farmed in South America, is farmed in the UK. So we've shifted um, a lot of our production of even arable stuff that traditionally was farmed outside to the UK. Um, that's not because of Brexit, that's because of the, the air miles implications. So I do think you're absolutely right. We need to not be hoodwinked because someone like, a, a bur I'm not going to name them, but a new non-meat burger company has huge PR resource and huge advertising resource. And unfortunately, you know, the world is not catching up to this. I don't, know, I, mean, I don't think America, I think Mike Bloomberg, is one of the rare people who actually is doing anything in the States. We have a business in the States. I don't feel the climate is changing in the States. I don't feel the climate is really ready in the Middle East, for example. So I think that we have a huge, a huge way to go in trying to get clarity. And, and it comes back to the customer the customer has to demand it at the end of the day. In all of these conversations about logistics and what happens in the supply chain, we've got to make sure that Greta is heard and that when uh, Extinction Rebellion go out onto the streets, we don't focus on the side issue, which is they're all hypocrites and uh, look, they've, they've destroyed a Leon, which you know, was in the paper on the Mail on, Sunday, on or the Mail on Sunday. That's not the issue. The issue is the fact that we have to recognise the fact that there are very complex issues and we need to find, like this event, much better ways of providing transparency on exactly things like soy. Richard Walker, for example, who, who did the, um, who's on our council, who did the palm oil thing on orangutans last year, but has done a lot. He's received death threats from the, the effective mafia controlled palm oil supply people. And it's very, very serious issue. You know, if you, if you stick your neck out as a CEO and you name particular uh, things like palm oil, then you get the, the governments in Asia literally paying PR companies to try and, try and destroy your reputation. So it is kind of a very serious issue. It's not just a question of like a bunch of hippies putting some, you know, some more vegetables on their, on their menu. It's a really, really dangerous, complicated question. And that's why events like this are really important to have, to have the debate. When you started out, Lee, and naturally fast food, you were to some extent out on your own. I yeah. feel other people have caught up with you to some extent. Is that great? I mean, do you, it's fantastic. Do you need to accelerate what you're doing now? Perhaps? Well, we, we are always, to be fair, we're always accelerating. I mean, one of the things we talk about, I talk, Julie and I talk about in this book, is the idea that if you do a martial art, it's much better that everyone else does that martial art. As in, as in it's, um, we, we don't see ourselves as wanting or seeking a competitive advantage over sustainability. Um, it would be very depressing if we ended up being the only people that were working to save the planet. That would not be very good. So um, I think we definitely would love other people to catch up. And ideally, we'd like other people to overtake us. Okay, that would fine. be wonderful. Got a final question. Yeah. How Is this a difficult one? How did you get here? Okay, I, I said to him earlier, I came in a taxi, don't ask me how I got here. He goes, I'm going to ask you that. Right. And then I realised it was an electric taxi that fucks the, that fucks the Pacific. Anyway, so, um, so, so I, got, I, w I walked to the station, I got a train, and then I got a taxi, but it was electric. You're a hero. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.